host of the Bad Friends podcast and comedian Andrew Santino is adding a third show when he stops by the Pantages Theater in February on his free speech tour. Tickets for a show on sale now. Full details, KFAN.com, keyword calendar. We talked a lot about schadenfreude, sports schadenfreude for Vikings fans in the wake of the big victory over the uh, San Francisco 49ers. There was... You know, at the highest level, it was nobody believed in us. We are significant home underdogs. Uh, the NFL power rankings, we've been towards the back end in most of them, at least certainly before the season began. And even after uh, beating the uh, terrible New York Giants, um, you had the fact that the guy you replaced Kirk Cousins with, Sam Darnold, the bridge quarterback, Play really well with a, you know, with one significant exception, that one interception in the second game against the 49ers for the second consecutive game, certainly played well enough to win, certainly recovered very nicely. You had the schadenfreude of your defensive coordinator who not that long ago, just a couple weeks ago, was under siege from the Miami quarterback Tua basically saying that he was the worst person in the world. And ultimately, the um, players here rallied around their coordinator. He put together a very successful plan, at least on third down, when the Niners were 2-for-10 on converting. Um, Ball-hawking defense again, a defense that through two weeks is third in the league in points allowed. That's really the only number that I am interested in, not so much yardage as points. And I love that third down number as well. And you had, I think, the realistic prospect of Kirk Cousins going to Philadelphia on in primetime TV last night and getting devoured. Remember, Cousins struggled mightily in his first game with Atlanta. That was a home game that the Viking that the uh, that the, the Falcons were supposed to win and they did not. And you had the feeling like, okay, we're going to feel even better about uh, the fact that uh, we moved on from Cousins and Cousins took the money and he's going to be 0-2 and, and it's just going to add another layer to the dis- deliciousness of the position we're in when it comes to schadenfreude. Well, the last part of it did not come to fruition. It felt like it was going to in that the Eagles were in perfect position to 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 seal away the victory. They couldn't. Um their uh, number one running back, of course, uh, ironically, a former Giants number one running back, drops an easy pass that would have ended the game. And then ultimately, um, after they kicked the field goal, then Atlanta's got plenty of time to come back. And Cousins was very good. The best I thought he was the entire game on that last drive, right? He looked methodical. He looked authoritative. He looked like he did know what city he was in. He certainly moved well enough as well. So, um, I, to Vikings fans, I'm sorry. I really, I may have led you astray. I definitely felt the vibe that Cousins was going to come back to Atlanta with his tail between his legs, all that money, but an 0 2 record and the possibility that there, well, there were, even during the game, there were people speculating on. The fact that Penix is going to start the next week, or Penix would have made that throw, he would have made that completion, it was endless. He at least lives to tell another day, because when push came to shove, he made the plays that he needed to play, needed to make for Atlanta to come back home with a victory over the Eagles. Who is the uh, Eagles' starting quarterback, Brett Blakemore? Jalen Hurts. I, I used to love him. I don't love him anymore. I, I don't. Now, he... He woke up the echoes with his legs a couple key times yesterday, which I think he needs to continue to do. Last year he didn't, in part allegedly because he was hurt. But <sighs> through the air, man, there's there's a lot of times where I just don't see it anymore. I, I don't know if other teams have figured it out. They've taken away some of his strengths. Um, but I I'm not as imp- I, he seemed to be on the fast track to being a perennial top three or four MVP candidate. I'm not sure I would put him at quite that level at this point. Um, meanwhile, there's ongoing discussion here locally about the uh, the Vikings start as we move up the power, the all-important power rankings in a lot of places. 
And there's a lot of celebrating going on about the ground game, which is the I told you so part. I certainly didn't tell you that the Vikings were going to start the season 2-0. and <laughs> No, not even close. But I did say that I thought the Vikings were going to give themselves the best chance to surprise the world, to shock the world, if finally Kevin O'Connell was going to make good on his yearly promise of paying more attention, more than lip service, to a ground game. And he has done that through the first two weeks of the season. Um, largely, Jones in Game 1, the combination of both his number one and number two running backs in game two. And I've always felt that the stat for me, it isn't about so much for me how many yards rushing you gain. It has more to do with what? Your yards per attempt, right? Isn't that the thing that is re- what really tells the tale about whether you can rely on the running game at least? being part of your offensive arsenal. And the insiders tell me that through the first two games of the season, the Vikings as a team are averaging 5.1 yards per attempt, which still, interestingly, is only top 10. I think that's ninth in the league. But go back to last year. Now, again, it's two games, and maybe at some point last year through two games uh, or or at any two-game stretch, we averaged five per carry. Uh, so you got to, there's some statistical issues here because they're so small of a sample size. But your eyes can tell some of the story. The ground game through two games has been legit. It's been a legitimate factor. It's been a part of what this team does. Sure, the 97 yard touchdown pass, they ain't no substitute for that, as we said yesterday. But averaging a yard more on the ground, analytically, that's big, right? And If you believe in the eye test more than the analytics, you can just see. You can watch what the Vikings have at running back right now. And, of course, on the the Jones fumble, I think that was on a swing pass, on a screen. Um, Jones, the key on Jones isn't necessarily just judging him on yards per attempt. It's on how many yards he gains every time he touches the ball. Um, Your guy, uh, is it Alec, Alec Lewis, had, I think, the piece in The Athletic. The Vikings already have 10 runs of 10 yards or more this season. Last year, the Vikings had only 11 runs of 10 yards or more entering week number seven. So we're seeing that this is the the most encouraging thing for Vikings fans who believe in meat and potatoes still mattering in the National Football League is whatever inclination the head coach might be to ease away from running so much. That's got to be eliminated when he sees success. The success through the first two weeks should encourage him that, yeah, this is the right plan. We are on the right track. We have to make this a part of what we do. And look, Bill Belichick, one of the great football minds of all time, had one. To me, the greatest thing about Belichick in his prime was he didn't care at all what he was told about balance. He, it, for him, it was never about, well, success. The key to success in National Football League is each week you, as close as possible, run and throw the same amount of times. No. The, the, the Belichick measure of success, the, philo- the only philosophy he cared about was who we plant. What's their weakness? Oh, they can't handle the pass? We'll throw 46 times. Next team can't handle the run? Well, if we're versatile enough, we're going to run 42 times. That's the story. So I'm not sitting here saying that every week the balance should be perfect. Any offensive coordinator or any head coach who is in charge of calling the plays has to, to a certain degree, read the scouting report, find the tendencies and the weaknesses of the other team and attempt to exploit those. And sometimes that might well be through the air more than it is on the ground. But over the course of a season, to have a real running game that takes so much pressure off, I think, your offensive line, takes pressure off your quarterback as well, is key. And we've seen the early signs of nurturing that concept, that it is important, it does matter, and with the early success, one could one would assume it's not going to be much of a reach for the head coach to say, yeah, we're doubling down on this because we see exactly um, how it indeed is is helping us. 
Um, so I, I, all those signs, I think, are are very good. And it looks as if, you know, there could be a pretty good two-headed monster here that also, one would hope, means you don't have to run Jones into the ground. He already seemed to get nicked up a little bit last week. Uh, and he had the bad fumble. That's not a good play. Was Jones much of a fumbler at Green Bay? I don't remember him as being much of a fumbler, like I, a huge issue. I wouldn't describe him as a fumbler. I mean, it happened every once in a while, but it does I, happen. I, I don't think it was a yeah. I don't think it was a huge problem. That is correct. Um, uh, Saquon Barkley obviously is the uh, is the former Giants running back who they clearly miss and who I guess has dropped like twenty five balls in the last five years, which is why a lot of people think even though it looked like a great wide-open play to steal the game or to seal the game, that it was not a good move by the uh, the Eagles. I would say more, well, yeah, because he dropped it. Um, it's easy to say that at this point. It sure as hell looked like a pretty high percentage play to me. He just didn't hold on to the ball. And it's not illegal, by the way, for your defense to make a play on that last drive because Atlanta had to score seven there, right? They, they, they were down, I think, five. They needed a touchdown, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it's not illegal for your defense to hold up there and to, or, or to just simply you know take a stand at home and make a play. John Bream is going to join us. This is the last second edition I was talking to. Longtime music maven slash writer, Star Tribune and StarTribune.com. Um, lots to get to with him about his role uh, being apparently interviewed like for days on a new Prince documentary. And I do want to talk to him about it's all the rage, the on-stage brawl that took place that got a lot of attention, um, that is apparently meaning has has meant the end of a tour for a very well-accomplished rock and roll band. So we'll find out what Bream's reaction to that was and also maybe what some of his other favorite on-stage rock and roll brawls are. If you have questions for him, hit the KFAN text line 64686. Mr. Bream will join us next. If you want to tell me what's happening to your favorite KFAN shows, you can make your voice heard on the Bradshaw Bryant KFAN text line. Just let us know what you have to say by texting your message to 64686. That's 64686, standard text message and data rate supply. I'm pretty sure John Bream was at that uh, original Vikings game, 1961, on this very date when the uh, Chicago, the haughty, Overconfident Chicago Bears came to town and a kid quarterback named Fran Tarkenton came off the bench and just destroyed them. Let's find out. Bream joins us on the Connecticut Water Systems Hotline. Were you at that game in 1961 and did you, did you storm the field? I did not storm the field. I was not at that game, although I did go to some early games because my dad's uh, company, they made men's outerwear, provided the... Uh, oh. The overcoats for the coaches, the players weren't allowed to wear them, but uh, Bud Grant or no Norm Van Brocklin and some of the other uh, early coaches wore them. I did not know that. That's interesting. Are, are you are you as old as me or older than me? I can't remember. Yes. <laughs> I don't think you're much older than me. How old are you? A couple of years older than you. I'm still 27 in my mind. <laughs> That's got to be 27 to review music. Well, you do. You're you're 100 percent right. Uh, that is probably a good conversation we should have when we even have more time because there there's you're kidding about it, but there's some there's actually some truth to it, and it's part of the reason I couldn't possibly review music because I live in the past, obviously. But uh, lots to try to cover here in a short period of time. Thanks for the um, accepting the request on sh- such a short notice. So we've got uh, Jane's Addiction announcing we're, sh- we're shutting her down the reunion tour after an onstage uh, brawl breaks out between the front man and uh, Dave Navarro. I guess you couldn't even say a brawl. Navarro was just on the receiving end of it. So what did you make of it? Um, and and because we all kind of like kid about it and 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 kind of get into the gossipy nature of it. I guess there's a chance that there could be something more significant here going on with an individual who's maybe going through some kind of a mental health crisis. What do we know about the uh, Jane's addiction controversy? Well, we don't know if it's a mental health crisis or if it's an addiction issue or a combination. Um, You know, this is a band that certainly had addiction issues. They've been, members have been to rehab before. Um, These things are volatile. They're combustible. It was a reunion tour. They haven't been together, I think, on the road for something like 14 years. You know, they broke up back in the day. 
Um, so no surprise. That this happened. No, and so do you have some favorite on you know on stage uncomfortable? Doesn't even always have to be a brawl, but just uncomfortable exchanges and or shouting matches, or at times when other individuals have had to be separated because of whatever bad blood suddenly well, it, perhaps it, it tends happens to exist. quite a bit. I yeah. mean, you, you find groups like the Everly Brothers that didn't talk to each other or Simon and Garfunkel in their later years, you know, didn't share a dressing room, traveled separately, came from opposite sides of the stage. But a couple that stand out would be our own replacements who literally broke up on stage at the Taste of Chicago in 1991. They just got so <laughs> pissed off at each other and they just <laughs> broke up. <laughs> Stormed off the stage. But Were you there? The Were you there for that one? That, pardon? Were you there for that one? No, I was not there. Oh, okay, okay. But probably the uh, classic would be the Eagles. Yes. 1980. It was a gig in Long Beach. Your friend Don Felder, your guy, mm -hmm. and Glenn Fry were having a war of words that was so... Um, hostile that the engineers turned off their microphones. Yes. So, you know, the debates weren't the first one to have microphones turned off. No. And then when the show ended, Felder walked off stage, sm smashed his guitar, and quit. <laughs> quit. Well, and th that story, one of those, I don't remember which, there was an extensive um, Eagles documentary. I don't remember if it was Showtime or I just saw it on Showtime, somewhere in which... You know, it, it clearly was, I wouldn't exactly say it was a balanced look at those sorts of controversies because it was a Fry-Henley operation. Uh, I think Felder was allowed to respond in the documentary, but it was fairly clear which way this went, and, and, and Fry just eviscerated him. The Fry allegation, as I recall, was that, you know, that, that when we, we came back together, Felder had this illusion that it was going to be like the old days. We were all going to hang together. We're all going to be in one car. And everything. It's like, well, no, that's over. We're, we're way past that, but we still feel like we can make some pretty good music together or at least make some money being on stage. And that, that Felder was being cranky about everything. He was never happy about anything. I never got to the bottom of that one, whether Felder got a bad rap there or, in fact, he, um, he got kind of what he deserved. Well, you start out as a band, you end up as a business. Yeah. And uh, you get into money disputes and ego disputes. And uh, when there's big money, you seem to have bigger disputes. Yeah, it's the way it tends to go, I guess, correct? Yeah. And, and you could say, again, when you... I, I actually... When I think about some of the groups that have managed, even through some breakups, to either stay together or get back together or even tolerate one another. I know a lot of times this is, to not be too cynical about it, these are financial arrangements. But I say to myself, God, if I have to be around the same people, you know, even for intermittent periods, over 30 or 40 years, I feel like it's kind of inevitable. I'm surprised that it actually doesn't happen more often. I mean, we, we, we all get sick of each other, don't we? We do. That's why guys demand to get traded from certain teams. Yes. We won't mention any names. Right. Stefan Diggs. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, you have to get along with people. You know, you have your two hours on stage or whatever, or your three hours on the football field, but you got to get along the rest of the time. And we find, Dan, that bands that have brothers in them, tend to have more fights because mm. there were things that probably pre-existed before the band started. Yeah, that's true. So sir. whether it was the Beach Boys or it's Oasis or it's the Kinks, the bands that have brothers tend to have fights. Philosophically speaking, John Bream, do you buy the note over the years you've been, the decades you've been covering popular music, do you buy the notion that a lot of the members of these bands where there have been battles, they insist... It's not fun to go through, but part of what made us whatever we were is the creative tension that is sort of part of the quote unquote, you know, uh, performing process or creating process. Do you buy that? Uh, well, yeah, that's part of the chemistry that, that makes the bands what they are. 
is it, it, good creative tension, but then we're, we lapse into ego tension or we re- yeah. lapse into drug and alcohol problems. Well, and that's where, that's the big one, right? I mean, that's what you hear from a lot of the folks who've, who've lived through some of these drug crises of their own making or of other members of the band. They ultimately say, whatever we, whenever, at one time we may have thought it was cool or we could handle it, but eventually what I think tends to happen, you'd like to think that people grow up and they go, I ain't going through this anymore. If you want to come back together, we'll come back together, but I'm not going to be around somebody who is strung out constantly all the time that we're fighting with. I went through that period. I'm done with it. I don't want to do it anymore. Those creative tensions when you're in your 20s and forming the band, and then when you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, you want it to be professional. You don't want those tensions again. You want everyone to be professional. You want them to be on time. You want them to perform like solid citizens, solid musicians. Now, your job is to cover music, not so much the police blotter, but I want to at least mention the story that's broken, um, I think, either yesterday or today, actually, involving uh, Diddy Combs, who um, I believe uh, a judge denied his request for bail after he uh, the rapper pleads not guilty to a series of very serious charges, including racketeering conspiracy, sex trafficking by force, fraud or coercion, and transportation to engage in prostitution. Um, early thoughts, or what have you heard about this story? Well, all I know is what I've seen on TV and read, read the, uh, the accounts of what the charges are. I mean, Diddy has been a powerful man in the music industry, um, and basically has done it as he's pleased. I mean, sometimes these guys watch movies and think they can uh, imitate that in real life, and uh, they find out later it's not appropriate, and they pay the price. Let's also talk, before we're done here, where where really I intended to begin, uh, cause, so we can spend the rest of the time on this story. This, I think... Remember when, excuse me, Dan, yes. remember when uh, uh, Quincy Jones put together We Are the World and he said, check your egos at the door? Yep. Well, there's not a lot of ego checking <laughs> in the music business, not often enough. Yeah, that's very good. That's a very, very fair point. Uh, this, I think, your, your first, what, what year did your first byline in the Star Tribune uh, or the first headline over a Bream review, what year would that have taken place? My first review in the Star Tribune, 1974. Okay, 74. I'm going to argue, Now I haven't read all those headlines, but I'm going to argue the headline on perhaps your most recent piece is the greatest headline that is a, that has appeared over any one of your stories or reviews. Here it is. I was grilled for six hours by the director of the controversial Prince documentary. That's a tabloid headline that means you have to click on it. It's 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 not possible to swipe off of that story and just move on to the next one. It's brilliant. Well, thank you. I wrote that. So do you think I should be writing for tabloids now? Well, I don't think there's any. I, I've always been a believer that Minnesota could use a good New York tabloid. I know it's unrealistic at this point. I'm not here to cause any competition for you or for a fellow Star Tribune people, but I, I, I've always felt like a little little tabloid journalism wouldn't be the worst in this town. You like those gossip sheets? Well, those accusations. I like a little bit of the, that edginess to it. Let's put it that way. I'm not going to yeah. pretend to defend all of the headlines that one might see in a tabloid. But let's talk about this. So why were you grilled for six hours by the director of the and should we call it controversial Prince documentary? His name is Ezra Edelman. He's best known for winning an Oscar for O.J. Made in America, that great series. He also great won series. Emmy for that. Mm-hmm. And he was uh, the second person hired by Netflix to do an authorized documentary on Prince. He was not a Prince fan. He had to do a deep dive and heavy research. He didn't know what he was looking for, so he was extremely well-prepared and asked you about everything and anything you could think of, from what it was like to interact with him, to what his drug use was, to what his religious beliefs were, 
any anything he could think of he asked you about. And when you use the term grilled, why that word? What 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 was what was the grilling all about, or how did why did you take it as a grilling? It's just there was a long, detailed interrogation in which he was extremely well prepared. Mm. It was you know maybe similar to what you would see a uh, a prosecutor or a defense attorney doing on to a witness on the stand. It it lasted six hours. I was there for six hours. And what would you say you learned about either the direction of the documentary or about the sensibility that he's gonna that he's bringing to this project? What do you think you learned from the the the, the series of questions and the approach, the tack strategy that he deployed? Well, I didn't really sense his angle, Dan. He was looking for everything. I mean, sure, on one hand, he's looking for dirt, but he's also looking for basic information, sure. basic facts. And, you know, when you walk into something where you don't know your direction, you're doing kind of a fishing expedition. And in the New York Times uh, magazine piece that ran a couple weeks ago um, that inspired my story, uh, his producer, the woman who recruited me to be interviewed, talked about his technique that he tries to interview people for a long, long period of time to break them down, to get them to open up. And that was not effective with me. I <laughs> pretty much knew what I wanted to say going in, yeah. and he wasn't going to get beyond what I wanted to offer. He wasn't going to pull any tricks, and I just said what I had to say. Do you think he was disappointed in you? Yes. He, well, he was disappointed in the fact that I wasn't giving him good footage yep. for the camera. The one-liners. You know, when, when you want someone on camera, you want them to be demonstrative. That's you. You want, you want them to be animated. That's you. And, and I'm about as stoic <laughs> as Bud Grant when I'm talking. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, I, you're, you're not you know, at the top of the list. Faced, right. And that doesn't make for good TV, doesn't make for no. good film. You need might it. make good sound bites, but when you're doing a documentary, you want long-form answers with some reaction. You need and I wasn't giving him the... The kind of physical reaction yeah. that he wanted to have on film. You need. I, I mean, I could sense his frustration because there were a couple times when he kind of revisits things, coming at a different angle and maybe a different way of phrasing it. And I wasn't moved. You weren't like bound to the chair, right? With like a heavy, hot light on you, where you felt like you couldn't get up whenever you wanted to. It wasn't that kind of hostage situation, was it? No, but it, it was a very. Um, you know, there was a crew of eight. The only person I could see was Ezra Edelman. The person talking to me could not see the crew. I mean, you could see the lights. You could could see the camera. I couldn't see the camera operators. Everything was dark. We were in this, you know, man, old mansion over by uh, the Art Institute. And it, it's a kind of place they rent out for parties and events and stuff like that. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, I suppose I could have gotten up at any time, but I had agreed to the interview, so I wanted to hear him out. They want... I did not get paid. Did not, okay. Well, it's it's fair to say they want animated, right? They want bombastic. They want... Well, not necessarily top. bombastic, but they want emotional Yeah, reaction. right, right, which is not, which is not, that's just not you. But I would, I would argue, if, uh, the assumption is he's talking to a lot of different people. So if he knows that... At some point, he's got to get, all right, I can, I, there's different things I'm going to get out of different people. I would assume what he should have been able or should be able to get out of you is depth and knowledge because of how far back you went and how much you covered. And I'd say you can get some of the other stuff elsewhere as well is that if, if, if you're really looking for breadth and variety, it's a matter of, okay, my job is to get the stuff I think I can get out of him, even if it might not be the most demonstrative. Well, yes, you're a veteran journalist and you understand that, you know, not, not every subject you interview is going to end up in the story with a direct quote, right? but you're gaining information, you're gaining knowledge, you're gaining, gaining context and background. And I'm sure he gained a fair amount of information out of me that he may or may not use. He may not, you know, use me on camera, but he could write about some of the things that I talked about or wrote about. All right. So as I understand it, there is serious question as to whether 
this documentary is going to see the light of day, right? The 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 estate is has already expressed some objections to I don't know if they already know specific things that he has unearthed or directions he wants to go. Give the estate has watched a version of it. Oh, they have seen it. Okay. So where is that headed? Is that headed inevitably to the courts here, or is there some kind of resolution coming? What do you think? Well, I think ultimately it could end up in court because one of the issues is the estate per the contract. Now, the contract was originally negotiated when Bremer Bank was uh, in charge of the estate, and Troy Carter was the entertainment advisor to the estate. And the contract, I believe, called for a, a six-part or six-hour documentary that the estate would have the right to review before it was broadcast for accuracy. Okay, now, I haven't seen the contract. That could be a vague clause. What's accurate? You know, is it factual accuracy right. or is it observational accuracy? You know, it's a judgment call at that point. And I, I sense the uh, estate might be fighting it on legal grounds if it was limited to a six-hour documentary. And Ezra Edelman has produced a nine-hour documentary. Well, maybe they're challenging it on that ground. And just think the Eagles documentary you referred to before was only three hours. That's true. We've got right. nine hours. Nine hours, yeah. Um, so is this a classic case? I mean, you know, like Edelman's pretty, like you said, is extremely accomplished. I guess I always wonder if if a if a deal is struck originally with a documentarian of this guy's ability, but also I think his willingness to go deep for the good and the bad. Why does anybody ever end up then on the other end? I'm talking about the estate folks surprised that the documentary is going that the documentarian is going to do his or her job. Well, it's different people involved. When the deal was cut. The- it was different executors of the estate. Now there's different executors of the estate, and they're much more protective ah, of his okay. reputation and legacy. And Edelman was not the original person they contracted with. Netflix's original deal with was Ava DuVernay. Mm-hmm. And after she worked on a documentary with Netflix on Prince for about a year and a half or two, she left for quote unquote creative differences. Then Netflix hired uh, Edelman to do it. I don't know if they had to renegotiate the contract or what the situation was. And is there a, are we at a point where there was a, a tentative date, release date, that was, the, you know, we, we knew when this was supposed to actually be available via Netflix? There was never anything firm. Okay. And you have to understand a little bit by way of background. Reportedly, the Prince Estate received tens of millions of dollars from Netflix for the rights, for this mm-hmm. authorized rights to do the documentary and to have access to the footage, recordings, videos, ephemera that's in the vault. Okay, at the time, the estate was looking at a huge tax bill, and they wanted to get that paid off. Uh, okay. So maybe the people handling the estate at the time didn't, look at all the little fine points in the contract is it uh you mentioned it's right now at least nine hours do you think there's nine that that you covered this guy forever so is there can you justify a nine hour you know documentary on prince he was very complicated and had very many facets very many persona remember that character you're old enough to know back in the 70s sybil who had like 16 different personalities and there was a novel about her and Mm -hmm. then there was a movie made sally field it was kind of like that right you didn't know who you would encounter on which day you encountered prince and it, it could change hour to hour and so yeah there's that much depth to explore i mean the guy put out more than 35 albums um, you know, if you just sure. look into the albums and, and you look into all his other artists that he worked with, there, there's a, a depth of material. Are there enough people that are interested in nine hours or would they rather have something shorter? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a fair question. A question that the public will answer. Yeah, I think here the answer is unequivocally yes. The question is obviously intent for a national or international audience. I, you know, I guess a lot of times it ends up depending on how well it's done, right? I mean, if if, if you feel like... 
through it five hours in, you feel like well, they're filling here, man. This is there's not uh, there's not enough here. A lot of it, uh, I think, depends not just on the subject, but just on how how well the story is is told. Correct. Well, that's true. But Edelman was shrewd in in terms of inviting the New York Times writer yeah. into the process a year and a half ago. I think he sensed that there was going to be a lot of blowback, and now he's kind of taken a preemptive strike by getting this information out there. Whether it comes out or not, we've certainly fueled the flames of the controversy and piqued people's interest sure. in seeing it by by having this 3,000-word piece in, in the New York Times that, you know, seeing the documentary drove Questlove to crying so much he had to call his therapist at 3 in the morning. Yeah. Have you not? Is I, I I somewhere along the way? I think I've heard you say this or write this more than once that you believe Prince is one of the lonely was one of the loneliest individuals that you ever wrote about or dealt with. Is that true? Well, he certainly died of loneliness. Um, he had a, a very lonely night, life, and uh, on one hand, in reality, he seemed to have a lonely life. But I've also said that he had one of the richest interior lives of anyone I know. He had one of the most vivid and rich imaginations, and that's what enabled him to create the great music that he did for so long. On that note, it was all in his head. Yeah, that's for sure. And in the vaults, right? There's still plenty in the vaults as well, correct? There's plenty in the vault, and have you ever been in the vault? had access to that up to a point, and when the new estate took over, they stopped access. I believe that was in 2022. Have you ever so been in the vault? from 2019 to 2022. Have you ever been personally in the vault? Uh, I was in the vault once personally when they were just opening Paisley Park, so I oh. might have been in it before Paisley okay. literally opened, but that was the only time i think maybe one other time i might have been at the door of the vault and i may have gone in or just they opened the door did does the last but item that was way back in like 1987 long time ago so you mentioned so the the people who are involved in with the estate now how do they view you do they do they, are they suspicious of you are they welcoming of you do they keep their distance or what how would you describe your relationship with them right now? All of the above. <laughs> well, that was how it was with Prince, too, right? All of the yes, above. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, on one hand, they they appreciate that I'm sort of the the longtime chronicle, yeah. chronicler of Prince and his, him, his work, and his legacy. But on the other hand, that uh, well, certain parts of the estate. I've never really dealt with Primary Wave, who control half of the estate. And I've dealt with the people at the Prince Legacy a lot, which is Londell McMillan and Charles Spicer Jr. And, you know, they're of the opinion that one should only say nice things about Prince and be protective of him and his legacy. And I tell them I just try to give the truth as I see the truth whether it's good, bad, or otherwise. You don't intend to ever retire, correct? I have no exit plan. Good. That's the way it should be. No reason that no reason that you should. I mean, eventually they might say, okay, it's a good run, but why anticipate that? Just play it out, correct? You've got nowhere to go. Exactly. That's it. You know, if you're going to retire, you got to retire to something. You shouldn't <laughs> retire from something. It's a very good way to put it. Thanks for the time, especially on short notice today. Good to get caught up, and we'll uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, John. Thank you, John Bream, the longtime pop music critic. When I say long time, I mean half a century, in effect, uh, rock critic for the uh, Star Tribune and StarTribune.com, dot com. Former compadre of uh, yours truly as well. We always appreciate his deadpan style. There is still or should be a place for deadpan. Everything should not have to be over the top. The Minnesota Renaissance Festival is happening now through September 29th, and we've got your chance to win tickets. Just head over to our contest page for your chance to win today. KFAN.com. Keyword contest to enter. Much earlier, I was um, asking folks to fess up. Those of you arrogant enough to think that if they've 
ordered if you've ordered your coffee at he- ahead at your favorite foo foo coffee sh- coffee shop that you somehow have every right to park in a handicap spot if that's the only spot close to the front door that is available to you I said I wouldn't necessarily out you in terms of your real name, so you could use a fake name or not a name at all, and some people have not disappointed. For example, this is from 763 Guy. Sorry, Dan, as an avid pre-order and pickup of my coffee, you have made me feel guilty enough in admission from your on-air rant that I am guilty of pulling up to both a handicapped and out-of-service parking spot at the same time and hogging up both spots with my rather large gas-guzzling pickup truck that has a loud aftermarket exhaust as well. I am therefore here for the shameful vetting process you honor through your on-air face-slapping as such, that which only you could provide. Hashtag Yadot, hashtag Yadit, hashtag Meowes. That is... um, (laughs) From seven, it's got away with words. Six three guy. Um, yeah, I don't know how much of it to believe, but I did like wanted to read it. Curbside pickup spots are fair game if everything is full. Those are reserved by the business, not the city or government. Veteran, handicap, and mom to be spots are off limits. I tend to agree with that assertion. That. Or if you're asking me for my outrage meter, it's not going to ever be as large when it comes to pickup spots, although, again, chances are you have a right to the pickup spot if you have ordered ahead, because that's the point of the pickup spot, is it not? I mean, that's the whole idea, is you've ordered ahead, and therefore you have, you have actually, you're supposed to have first dibs on those places, correct, as opposed to somebody who's just going into order. Well, if you've got a pre-reserved, if you've got a pre-order, yeah. then why not just use the curbside pickup? Yeah. Then you don't have to get out of your car at all. Well, that, well so. yeah, it, well, if that's available, then, I mean, you can go through the drive through but then if there's a long line in the drive through you do not necessarily want to do that, correct? So one of my favorites I just did today is at Select Chick-fil-A's, there's a separate drive through line oh, is that just what? for mobile orders, oh, interesting. which is the best. It's a mobile throw. I skip, Maybe that's the trend. I, I skip seven or eight cars every time. I didn't even know that existed. Time. That's very oh, good. the best. Yeah, that is outstanding. Yeah. Uh, no disrespect, but feel like people who spend even 10 seconds waiting around to get a parking spot in front of a store are of lesser intelligence, especially when you're about to walk a couple miles through the mall or Costco. What's the point? I live my life at the back of the parking lot with smarter people that's kind of a callback to what you were talking about Mm -hmm. earlier and there is i think something to be said for that um dan i would uh this is from 763 guy i would uh i've never have never nor would i use a handicap spot to quickly run into a store to purchase an item however i recently used a spot to load 40 20 pound boxes the door where the boxes were located was adjacent to the handicap spot it took all of five minutes And I was never more than 10 feet from my car loading the boxes with four staff from the building. I didn't feel guilty about taking the spot in that situation, but perhaps I need to be redirected. I would have immediately moved if needed thoughts. Well, those are the kinds of, you know, exceptions that make the the conversation much murkier. Uh, Dan from East Grand Forks. My daughter was born with disabilities. She is 15 now, wheelchair bound. We had to renew our handicapped vehicle permit every few years. Her doctor had to sign off on it. We were told this most recent renewal is good for life. I shake my head when people without handicap permits park in these spots. I don't even use the handicapped parking spots because I feel there is always going to be someone else in worse shape. Now, a couple of people threw out this scenario. How do we feel about public restrooms? that sometimes are supposed to be reserved for handicapped individuals. I need some help on that one because I would assume that the whole point of those, here's the question. Are those labeled as such to indicate that if you do have those kinds of challenges, this restroom will make it easier for you. It's They're made for you to deal with those kinds of challenges. Does that necessarily mean that they are reserved only for those individuals? I honestly don't know. Now, I, I would say I would try and have tried to stay away from them 
If you're in a desperate situation, what do you do? I don't know. But I need help on what the rules actually are governing those sort the restrooms that are labeled as such. Do you know? I, I don't know if there's if they're reserved. And I'll say this. I don't think they are. Uh, I would, would never park in a handicapped parking no, spot. No, period. End of that. story. But. When you got to go, you got to go. I don't mind a little leg room. <laughs> well, yeah. But that is the worst. And I've seen a thousand videos on that of someone in the, like, videotaping on their phone and them seeing, like, a wheelchair pull up to the to the yeah. stall. Nightmare. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, we're late already for Top 5 at 5. What's that going to include? Uh, lots of NFL talk and maybe a Minnesota Wild mention for Kevin Fallman. <laughs> Time now for the Vikings Report on The Fan, presented by Miller Lite. Viking safety Cam Bynum joins Barrero next after this from Miller Lite.